Hey Olga, welcome to Network Capital. We're really excited to have a conversation with you about your career and your new book, Weird. Could you tell us a bit about who you are and what do you do today? Yeah, um, I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic. I cover health and science primarily. So I, in addition to writing about psychology and um, uh, and work life issues, I also am covering coronavirus right now. So um, it's always interesting. Um, the title of your book is really interesting. It's called Weird, but the subtext of it is even more interesting. The power of being an outsider in an insider world. Could you tell us about why you decided to write a book on being weird and what does this uh, sentence mean, the power of being an outsider in an insider world? Yeah, so um, I got interested in this topic because I had a sort of an unusual um, background, an unusual childhood. I, I'm, I'm a refugee from the Soviet Union and I grew up in West Texas. Um, and uh, I had always wondered kind of how that affected me, um, that kind of childhood of being kind of the only one uh, in my in my situation um, of my background. Um, and I um, so I got I've just always been interested in other kind of fish out of water type people, people who are different from everyone else around them who are unique in whatever they're doing. Um, and um, I, I kind of wanted to write, you know, after I started researching uh, this phenomenon of, of being different or, or being kind of culturally out of place, um, I found that there were a lot of advantages associated with that. Um, so I kind of wanted to reclaim um, the term weird and kind of uh, see it as like more of a positive thing rather than what it's kind of often thought of, which is a, a negative, uh, negative thing. And how come the power of being an outsider in an insider world? What's the superpower that you get from being an outsider? <laughs> yeah. Um, so the power that I find is um, really is creativity that that I that I noticed among the people that I interviewed and from the research that I read. Um, people who are culturally uh, out of place or who even have just been rejected, even if they aren't from a different culture, tend to. Um, come up with more creative solutions and um, have a greater amount of creativity in their problem solving. Um, and they also tend to help groups solve problems better. Um, they, they keep groups from going down the path of like um, sunk costs and, and um, groupthink. Um, so that's kind of the main power that I discovered. So is being different the same as being weird? Um, yeah, yeah. So my definition was pretty much people who are um, different from everyone else around them. So what I did is I found situations that were homogenous. So like a uh, um, uh, jobs that were you know 100% male or 100% female, or um, uh, areas of the U.S. that voted you know 100% Democratic or 100% um, liberal. And I tried to find the people who were kind of bucking that. Um, uh, trend who were kind of doing the opposite thing of all of their neighbors or all of their peers. Uh, and I kind of profiled them. And you came up with a whole bunch of stories. I won't ask you which is your favorite, but uh, could you give our audience just a flavor of how you went about writing one story as such? Uh, pick anyone, the race car driver or um, you know, somebody similar to your background. I just want the readers to understand what goes into producing a proper story um, that comprises the book. Yeah, so there are several, there's a lot of stories in the book um, of different uh, types of um, quote unquote weirdos. Um, uh, I, so for the race car driver, it's uh, Julia Landauer and she's a, a female NASCAR driver. Um, I met her originally at a work event and I, um, um, kind of asked if I could follow her at a race. Um, so that one was kind of very specific because after I interviewed her a couple times, I, I basically went up to see her um, uh, drive. I, I watched her uh, participate in a race in Canada. Um, and then I uh, wrote about how it went. So kind of the story goes from her like um, raising money to become a race car driver. And then because there's like a lot of fundraising involved in that uh, profession, which I didn't realize um, earlier but um so i kind of follow her struggling as she tries to raise money and then finally finding a team and then finally being able to race um and um so that was sort of the arc of her story but but other people have different arcs uh, usually it starts with them kind of realizing that they don't fit in in their situation 
and kind of uh, following them as they figure out what they're going to do about it and um, how they like resolve their their weirdness, whether they decide to conform or how they how they kind of um, adapt to fit into their environment. Did you relate to Julia's story at all? I mean, in all honesty, when I first heard the term NASCAR, I didn't really know what that meant. So I looked it up and uh, I realized that uh, what really goes into, um, you know, becoming excellent at that sport. I was wondering if you, when you heard her story, did you relate to your own in some way or did you feel that your story was uh, completely different or touched upon different aspects of being weird? Yeah, I, so I I don't so um so I'm not like the only female journalist um so she's she's really you know her, in her gender she's really unique because um most uh, NASCAR drivers are men um kind of the ways that I did relate to her though is that um, journalism is a really tough profession you're you're just always it's a lot of hard work it's like a ton of rejection and she faces that as well so it was kind of like um. I did relate to her kind of constant um, up, uphill battle of trying to, to break through in this really tough profession. Um, mm-hmm. And so kind of her tenacity um, was really inspiring. Um, and at times, like in the book, even I kind of wonder, how is she able to do this given like, I mean, really, it's like, it, it's like no driving time compared to all the time that you spend uh, getting ready and like raising money and trying to get it all organized. <laughs> it's, it's, and then it's like 30 <laughs> seconds of driving. <laughs> um, and she's really an anomaly, right? I mean, she's an engineer, like she's, she's, a, she's a deeply technical background and then she decided to pursue a career in a completely different field. And uh, she seems quite comfortable in her skin from whatever I researched and understood about her. And when we look at you, although you're remarkably successful and an award-winning journalist, um, there are times when you mentioned that uh, you've had self-doubt and you felt that, uh, why aren't you fitting in? Could you contrast that or share some more color into it? Oh, into why I've had self-doubt? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so you're right. I, I have been really lucky and I have a great career and I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to... Um, downplay that at all um I think where some of my doubt comes from is that I I don't um a lot of journalism uh there there's like a very like um a lot of journalists have a lot of a very privileged background um and they kind of grew up reading magazines and newspapers or they went to an Ivy League school or um they kind of come from a news type family that that was like very uh engaged around the news. Um, and I, I didn't really come from that. Uh, I, I didn't have any of those things. And so especially early in my career, it was really hard to prove my bona fides, I guess. the language, right? When you um, uh, came from Russia, your folks were in the LA and then here? Um, yeah, I mean, um, my parents didn't speak English when they came here, no. I mean, but I, I grew up here in the US. So I I've spoken English my whole, it wasn't really a language thing. It was just, it was just more of a cultural thing. Like there's, there's just like this distinct culture of journalists that I didn't really feel like I fit into. And now that you've spent some time here, do you feel that uh, you not coming from the inner circle has given you, uh, say, a different kind of superpower? If yes, I'd love for you to explain what that is. Sure. Yeah. I, I think ultimately, yeah, it is a good thing. I mean, it's still hard to see this sometimes because I do, I mean, I like, it's not like a, a switch flipped and I completely believe this now, but I, I do sort of see the upside of having more of a um, less privileged background in, in as a journalist, just because you can kind of connect with people who are regular readers. Like you, you don't, um, you're, you're not necessarily just focused on people who are like, on Twitter all day and, and went to Ivy League schools and things like that. Like you understand what regular readers want and how they think. Um, and so I, I kind of am thankful that I that I have a more kind of average, I guess, background um, uh, just because it, it helps give me that perspective on uh, on what on what the average reader wants. <laughs> Do you have lots of friends? Um. I do have some friends. I, I don't have a ton of friends right now because we're all in quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't seen anyone in a while, but I think theoretically they're out there. 
um, because you you mentioned in your last piece that uh, you also had a hard time uh, just choosing friends or making friends, and you also felt like a fish out of water, um, you know, when you were picked to be a, like a chairperson in um, in your in your college and so forth. So why like this existential quest and uh, your uh, your choice of friendships? Um, how did that uh, shape its way into your writing the book? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, I should I should say, yeah. So making friends has, has been a struggle. for. So I didn't really have friends until college. And then I, um, yeah, I, I definitely struggled to to make friends. And I still I still do. I mean, I have I have friends, but I'm not like a social butterfly, I would say. Um, uh, and, and yeah, that was that was sort of a big part of of kind of why I was drawn to this topic is just that, I mean, it's not like I lived in Texas and had this like really odd um, at times difficult experience and then it just completely went away like it, it kind of stayed with me and I still have a lot of social anxiety and a lot of kind of feelings of um, I don't know just like discomfort socially so I, I, I write about that in the book about some ways to deal with social anxiety and of um, feeling kind of uh, like inadequate or not good enough. So what's worked really well for you? Um, in your Atlantic piece, you had covered some topics about being there for yourself and so on and so forth. Um, just curious if you had some tips from your own life. Yeah. Um, so the in the book, the the thing that I did for social anxiety that I write about in the book is um, this app called Joyable, which um, relies on the um, it's called the three C's of um, social anxiety. And it's um, uh, catching an anxious thought checking an anxious thought and changing it. So basically what you do is you, as you're feeling anxious, you um, kind of uh, observe that you're feeling anxious about something. So like, let's say you go to a party and someone snubs you, they, they don't talk to you. Um, so you kind of observe that, okay, I'm feeling anxious because this person didn't really talk to me. Um, and then you challenge whether, and so let's say like you're, you're thinking, oh, that, that person must not really like me. Um, so then you kind of challenge whether that is actually accurate. Like, what are, uh, what is, is, you know, is it realistic that the person doesn't like you? Or is it possible that they just didn't see you or they were in another conversation or, you know, that they had something else going on? So that's kind of the check it part. Um, and then you change it by essentially coming up with a more accurate thought that is um, more likely to have been the case and is probably less anxiety inducing. So it's something like, um, well, this person didn't say hello to me, but they, it doesn't mean that they don't like me. It just means that they, uh, were kind of wrapped up in another conversation or they had something else going on that day. So they didn't really notice me or something like that. Uh, so essentially you, you kind of, uh, you kind of like take your own thoughts and change them, um, through this app. And, I, I, I will say that it was helpful. I mean, part of the reason it was helpful is that it came with this coach type person who would call me right. and check in with me frequently. And that was really nice um, and helpful. But um, I personally like I would say just doing it on my own uh, wouldn't have been as helpful. It was it was like especially helpful because I had the person helping me along. Um, so, um, yeah. Got it. Got it. How do you balance um, being liked or trying to be liked? I don't know if you if you want to be liked or not versus being a contrarian, which you sort of have to be as a science journalist or to be able to write pieces that do well. Oh, how do you balance being liked versus being a contrarian? Yeah. Um, I yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I guess I'm not that much of a contrarian. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do. I am a little bit of a contrarian. Um, I Your mean, pieces are so well researched and you the examples that you quote. I mean, this book in itself is a contrarian book, right? I mean, since when did weird being weird become a badge of honor? But you make a, 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 a very substantive case for it. So, I mean, I think you are one, but I'd love to hear more. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, maybe I'm being contrarian and saying that I'm not contrarian. Um, yeah, well, I guess like, I mean, to me, there's like a difference between people disagreeing with your opinion and people um, disliking you. I don't know. I That has been hard. to. I, I think you're, you're right. That has been hard to untangle. I, 
uh, I um, I have had a lot of a lot of issues with um, wanting people to like me and not wanting to make them mad and then like feeling bad if I make them mad. Um, and that's been something that it's only gotten better with time. Honestly, I have I don't have like a trick for that. <laughs> I would just hope that other people I don't know. But it is it's tough. And it's like it's like one of the reasons why it's hard to be weird and hard to be um, different and hard to voice different opinions, even like for people who aren't writers on the internet, you know, it's still hard to sit in the meeting and say, no, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think we should do that project. Like, you know, it's, it's hard to voice those kinds of things because you don't, you want your coworkers to like you and you want to be respected and everything. Um, you know, but at the same time, those dissenting opinions are really valuable and they really help the group make better decisions. Um, so you really are kind of putting your own likability on the line, you know, in, in for the goal of like, you know, better, a better outcome and a better work project. So I don't know, it's, it, it takes like a, a especially tough person to not be like bothered by that, I think, to like, right. not worry about other people's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a battle, right? I remember what you said uh, when you were with your journalism classmates that uh, um, essentially, why do journalists exist? And uh, you expressed a contrarian opinion. And then I really loved the way you analyze your thought, because I do feel that a lot of us grapple with this uh, sort of conundrum uh, of being liked versus being speaking what on what's on one's mind. And then, you know, quote unquote, trying to be authentic. Uh, your authentic self. Um. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, that was a perfect example because, like, I probably would just not say that nowadays. <laughs> I probably would just not. <laughs> Do you want to tell them? Are you comfortable talking about it to the? Oh, listeners? that experience. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess the full story is that I was, um, I was p part of this grad school um, group of students who was chosen to, um, to essentially cover this science conference and um we all were like uh in a in a we all spent a lot of time together and it was it was kind of special because it was the first time that that we really had a cohort of us who were journalists and kind of felt like journalists and felt um you know like we were treated like reporters and we had all these fancy dinners together and it was just very um like a special new experience um but it was like it was like very new to me to even have dinners with other people. My parents never had people over for dinner. And, and I, I just didn't, I just hadn't had a lot of like interactions with people in a professional setting yet. <laughs> um, so I remember so, uh, you know, people were excited about their careers and we were sort of starting talking about starting out as journalists in our careers. And um, uh, I like said, well, you know, I got into this to help people but don't you ever think that like journalists are basically not really that helpful like we're not we're not really that useful to society because we don't really fix anything we just point out things that need to be fixed right. uh and, and it just totally was a wet blanket on the whole <laughs> night like <laughs> things got really quiet after that and people just tried to move on kind of quickly and no one really I mean someone said like that's a really pessimistic way of looking at it and like I think that's true, but like that's that wasn't. I was just sort of thinking aloud. Like I wasn't. I don't know. I guess it my it's my nature to kind of like proffer like ideas and like see what people say in response. And it's not really like like I would have been fine with it if people had been like, no, I think you're wrong because X Y Z. Like I don't know. I I guess I I just didn't. I, I the thing I should have picked up on was that everyone was there to like feel happy and make friends and not to like have a deep philosophical conversation about the purpose of life. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah so that was like a time where I was like letting my weirdness shine and it kind of uh it didn't go well <laughs> uh <laughs> Olga um could you tell us about your friendships like do you form friendships or do have you found that people who identify as weird do they try and surround themselves with similar people or uh is that not the case yeah that's a really good question so I did find that getting support was a big part of how people who are weird um, make it like through the, the like, so Julia has a very supportive, the, the NASCAR driver, she has a very supportive family um, and uh, they like come to all her races and they coach her and they help her. And so she's, you know, even though she's like all alone and doing this really challenging thing, she has this really supportive um, network to, to kind of fall back on. Um, I would say that um, other 
so there was there was one person I met who kind of said he didn't have any friends at the outset. And then he kind of like purposefully made more friends because he realized that it was just so hard. Um, like his life was so terrible um, without uh, without friends that um, he actually like just had this like breakdown about work and he ended up like having an affair. And like it was just like very it was awful because he had like nowhere to turn. And he basically told himself, like, I have to make friends or else I'm going to kind of go nuts here. Um, so he purposefully set out and made friends, not necessarily even people who were weird like him, but just like literally anyone <laughs> who crossed his path because he was like, I'm starting from scratch. And he would like put reminders to like text his friends and like send them <laughs> cards and things like it was very, uh, it was very uh, systematic. Um, so so, yeah, I, I would say that people um, tried to surround themselves with other like minded people. A lot of people I interviewed didn't live near anyone who was like minded to them, like so they just made big compromises in who they were willing to be friends with. So, you know, if it was a huge liberal, but they were living in a really conservative area, they just had a bunch of conservative friends and would kind of like ignore the parts that didn't really fit with their own beliefs. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I would say they kind of bumbled through. They all made they all made friends, but they weren't necessarily all like minded uh, individuals, if that makes sense. They were sort of a grab bag. <laughs> Um, is that uh, how about you do you have people uh, who are your friends who are like you or do you travel across the board Um, I would say most of my friends are a lot like me but especially in particular they tend to be writers Um, and then some of my closer friends are other Russian Jewish refugees or Russian refugees Um, I honestly have found that I'm willing to be friends with whoever, but when I really need those like comfort moments or like those moments of like, when I have like extreme anxieties or when I really feel like I need support, it has to be from someone who understands where I'm coming from. And I feel like it's such a specific experience to grow up Russian in the U S that I really feel like I need someone with that exact frame of mind just to like so they can be on my level right away and it's it's not that and no one else can it's just that I found that it like you can save so much explanation by you know reaching out to someone who kind of understands where you're coming from so that's you know I didn't I didn't set out to make make friends that were kind of like with that background it just kind of happened but I have found that like when it comes to those like really hurt um like moments or really need a friend moments uh it's really handy to have someone who understands you really well i don't know if you've studied this or not but is there any like is this can this be extended to romantic partnerships or other kinds of partnerships as well that people typically gravitate towards people like them yeah so so on friendships uh friends are similar on something like 96 percent of all qualities um uh, so unfortunately that yeah <laughs> well, that's really yeah specific. Um, and then, uh, for romantic partners, it's, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's generally true that people tend to seek out people with their same background as a romantic partner. Um, yeah, they, they tend to basically opposites don't attract (laughs) similar people end up (laughs) together. Um, which is, I don't, yeah, I mean, you know, that could be good though. If you're, if you're really, uh, like an unusual person or have an unusual personality, finding someone who, you know, is is also weird can can help you feel more accepted and more um loved so um you know there's that but but yeah unfortunately like people tend to look for other people like them um you had some uh, really interesting insights on introversion and weirdness as uh, i read susan kane's quote on the book and uh, that was beautiful she says that weird reveals the secret strength strength of uh, being different um is there any study or did you explore introversion and weirdness at all yeah some people have asked me this um i found that most of the people i talked to were probably a little bit on the introverted side um are you as well yeah i am i would say um but i didn't like seek out introverts if that makes sense like I I didn't really look at their personality when it came to interviewing them it just so happened that they for the most part seemed to be pretty introverted a couple of them though were pretty extroverted um but like Julia Landauer's like strikes me as pretty introverted um 
uh, a few other people, they just seem kind of more, mm, more like kind of to themselves a little bit more kind of like, uh, you know, in their, in their heads kind of people. Um, and I think that might just be because they, they're kind of off on their own. They're like <laughs> doing, you know, they don't have a ton of, uh, people, you know, exactly like them doing whatever they're doing. Um, it took you five years to write this book along with a super busy job. How do you balance uh, producing Atlantic pieces consistently and working on a book and uh, the other travel that you undertake? How was this discipline sustained for five long years? Huh. Well, it was definitely fits and starts. Like I, I started it five years ago, but I, it's not like I worked, you know, nonstop for five years. Um, I did take a book leave, so that helped. Um, so I was gone for part of, uh, part of last year and part of 2018. Um, and, um, yeah, a lot of weekends. I don't have kids. That probably helps. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I don't know. I, I, I really enjoyed working on it, but it was, it was a lot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, in terms of, uh, the way you write, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of research that you quote, and I, you're also producing these uh, short form videos, at least the ones I stumbled into. Uh, what's the process of producing an article that's, uh, or, 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 a, or a book that's both insightful and engaging? And how can young people who want to do this, uh, um, what would be your advice to them? Oh, wow. Oh, thank you so much for, for reading my stuff. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I read all your pieces, by the way. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I would say that um, the the yeah, I, I would say just follow what interests you. Um, as far as you know, if it interests you, it's probably going to interest someone else. As far as writing interesting interesting things, and um, I don't know. I, I, I yeah, I. I don't know. It's it's really hard to offer advice for how to write in an interesting way, but I, I would say the best Just way to... Just talk about it. your own writings. Uh, um, let's pick this article that I really liked of yours uh, recently. Let's look at the jobs that really matter uh, around the coronavirus crisis. And I was stunned by the level of depth of research. So in terms of putting that uh, uh, article together, what was your mental framework or model like like what what were some of the things that you wanted to cover how much of that was organic and uh, how much of this uh, you had built on some of the previous reading and insights that you had gleaned well I always start I mean I, I'm the kind of person who I learn better by interviewing than I do by reading so I usually start Isn't by that your favorite part of your job yeah, I love I love interviewing. So so I, I start usually by interviewing a ton of people. And so for that one, I believe I interviewed like 15, 15 experts. Um, so once I've and usually that, you know, ideally, the interviews will lead me to other interesting directions. And um, so I actually got that Hamburg idea from um, there's a, a part in the story about Hamburg. And I, I got that idea from one of the interviewees and um kind oh, of dove into it that way so so yeah so I I kind of I, I kind of start with interviews and then I kind of go from there um and I, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't <laughs> it's better when it um it's better when it does work <laughs> and uh, and in terms of research is that something that you do beforehand or you let serendipity guide you or is it a bit of both uh, it's a little bit of both. I like to do a pretty deep literature review of the published work before I start. Um, but sometimes things will come up while you're working on it that that is is relevant and you'll start to want to include it. So for weird in particular, I read a ton of studies before I started. But then also while I was writing, things kept coming up that I was like, oh, I shouldn't I should include this like this is this is noteworthy. This is noteworthy. Or like what else? You know, is, has this been replicated? I, I kind of you kind of have like your anchors and then you kind of grab out from the anchor and like uh, build build up, you know, the material based on what you know is going to be included. Right. Um, who have been some of your mentors or influences in your life who've shaped your career? Um. Oh, wow. I mean, everyone from grad school, all my all my professors that I had um, when I was in grad school, um, like Alan Middlestat, Mark Cooper, Casey Cole. Um, 
uh, Richard Rushfield is a mentor of mine. He's a journalist in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, those are, yeah, those are pretty much my, my big mentors. Um, and uh, finally, could you tell us, uh, are there any book tours once this corona crisis is over? Uh, we have uh, Network Capital community chapters in 104 countries. We'd love to, you know, share some lessons of weird and have our readers include this as part of our book club. So any upcoming plans once this is over, maybe online ones? Yeah, I mean, um, I've been doing a lot of online book talks um, and online events. Um, I would love to keep doing those. And I'd also be up for doing them in person. I just don't know when that's going to be like um, it, we <laughs> like we still don't really know when it's going to be OK to have events again. So um, like a lot of things What's this summer. Best guess? But, uh, I mean, I I really don't think that big events are going to be held until like the fall at the earliest Right. Um, what? What? Yeah, I was just uh, asking what what was your best guess. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think they're going to really be held until the fall. So, I, I do have some stuff I'm trying to line up for the fall, but I mean, I'm not even sure if those are going to. I don't know if we're going to be able to really do them. It's a scary time. I mean, I'm I'm down for doing stuff online, but yeah, in person is is tricky right now. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, this is uh, this has been such a delight, uh, Olga. We're gonna sh uh, send this out to 100,000 subscribers on our podcast, and uh, um, hopefully they'll be able to get a digital uh, version of the book with you uh, of yours. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, yeah, they they can buy the ebook on Amazon and um, also a hard copy. They, Amazon's delivering pretty regularly now, so um, yeah. Yeah, in the US it is. In the UK. Uh, sort of but many countries they aren't actually which is why i was uh, asking about the digital book oh i'm so sorry about that yeah i don't know why that's happening um i'm sorry about that and yeah the digital might be the best way to go um yeah just and is, is there an audio book or a plan of that yep there's an audio book now available so they can do they can do that if that's um if that's preferable Oh, that that would be great. Actually, we on in Network Capital plan to make uh, your book weird as part of our book club. So we're going to be reading it as a large community and we're quite looking forward to it. Oh, yeah, that's great. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, super. Thank you so much for your time. This was uh, really good fun. Yeah, it was for me, too. Thanks again and take care.